All right. Well, we don't want to sit here all morning waiting for people. Okay. So we can go ahead and get rolling. And um, if anyone jumps on, we'll kind of just get a quick intro from them and keep things moving and can always direct people toward um, the YouTube video once that gets posted. So mm -hmm. to start us off, my name is Brian Olius. Um, I work at here at SHP. I've been here for September will be nine years for me. Uh, and I'm actually uh, licensed in Ohio and Kentucky and have my NCARB certificate and working in Cincinnati as the NCARB licensing advisor in the area with a lead GA. Um, and John? Yeah, so I'm John Edwards. I work at RWA Architects. I've been here for about just past seven years this month. And yeah, also on the early professional committee. Mm. And we've got a number of references here that we've brought up in past sessions. I don't think we'll really need any of them for today's session, but um, they're always good resources to hold on to. Um, Yazid, uh, would you mind giving a quick introduction of yourself and kind of where you're at in the journey of taking the ARES? Hi, good morning. Uh, yeah. My name is Yazid. Uh, I am a design professional at Westalk. Uh I moved to Ohio eight months ago and I've been with Westalk for about three months now. So uh, the journey of getting the license is going to be a bit long, especially with the EESA that I have to do. And oh, okay. I to, yeah, I might take a couple of classes. Uh, yesterday, I emailed my professor. Last time I talked to her was like eight years ago, I guess, asking for my transcripts. So it's going to take a bit of time to get the transcripts and do that, get the my certificate to be approved. So uh, I'm really excited about this journey. And I have a, a co-worker who's always cheering up, Javen Ziegler. She's sitting uh, behind me. So she's always like, do this, do that, you need to do that. So she's very helpful. Good. Yeah. I think Darian's led the other half of these uh, sessions that I haven't been on. And yeah, she's a yeah. wealth of knowledge. Yes. <clears throat> well, that's fantastic. And, uh, you know, that's, that's not a, a typical path that some of us see, uh, but it's certainly a valid one. And if you have specific questions about that, I don't know if I'll necessarily be able to answer them immediately, but we can always do a deeper dive into, you know, and carbs guidelines and everything on any hurdles that you might hit and how we can get through those. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Cool. So let's get into this exam. Oh, sorry. I made a quick note of this. Um, it really helped out a colleague last week. Uh, I don't know if it'll be very useful for anyone on a video, but NCARB was waiving reactivation fees for the last month and a half. It actually really helped a colleague who's uh, pursuing an alternate path to licensure and he was able to reactivate his record for like $80 instead of the stacked 300 or so dollars for a uh, lapsed record. So just a note on that, um, NCARB gives opportunities like that every once in a while. So today uh, we're going to cover each division of uh, PDD and what those mean, and and then we're going to hit a number of sample questions and kind of just run through those examples and understanding the thought process of that. So to start off, uh, us off, we'll give a general overview of project development and documentation, the division of the ARES that we're going to be talking about today. <clears throat> so this test has 100 items. Um, only 91 of those is, are scored. Uh, there's some hitting questions. You'll never know which ones aren't scored. So treat every question like it's it's uh, worthwhile. Uh, it'll have two case studies with 16 to 20 questions each. Um, our test is four hours and five minutes long with an optional break time of 45 minutes. Again, that break can be split up however you want it, but there are some consequences to when you take your break or not, not being able to look back at previous questions. Um, total appointment duration is five hours. So this is one of the largest ones that um, 
sometimes it can be more difficult to schedule these ones just because they are a larger block of time and the way they, the, that those testing center works uh, a lot of times they'll split up their days into morning sessions and afternoon sessions this test stretches both of those so you pretty much block out a, one of their seats for the entire day and which can ultimately make it a little bit more difficult to schedule um, this one in particular is going to be looking at evaluating project documentation for the constructability of the project on, of a building and site, integrating technical knowledge and information to refine a design, integrating materials and building systems to meet the project design requirements, and translating design decisions into appropriate construction documentation. Um, I think I had some notes on timing on this that I think will come up in another slide. Just think about how many questions you have and how much time per question you can really think about and kind of give yourself some milestones when you're when you're getting to that and as we get into each of these sections this is sort of the breakdown of how many questions you can expect to see in each of the topics that this test covers and so you can really start to see that it leans real heavy on section one and two you can expect about 60 percent of the test questions to be about integration of materials and systems and the just the construction documentation um, it's definitely going to be good to know your specifications codes and cost estimate things but if definitely take note of how much this test leans toward that documentation uh, looking at the references for this exam it's very similar to ppd um, and it covers pretty much the, the gamut of all the resources that NCARB recommends. Um, architectural graphic standards is one of the highlighted ones that is very important for this exam. It is essentially a catalog of typical construction details and the kind of materials that you would see in different systems. It is extremely useful that, for this, uh, particularly for visual learners. It's not just a uh, dense textbook it's it's a different way of learning with it and it's very understand understandable um, building construction illustrated falls into that same sort of category uh, very helpful very visual with details and very helpful um, international building code important we'll be we'll definitely hitting on a couple topics with that today um, just to note that NCARB does still reference the 2018 IBC. Um, they have not jumped to the 2021 IBC yet. Um, and we'll we'll keep people posted when that change comes, but I have not heard of any change on that soon. Um, mechanical electrical equipment for buildings and the uh, construction principles, materials, and methods. These are marked as important references. Uh, we don't have, I don't think we have a physical copy available, but we may be able to get digital copies available from for the AIA Cincinnati library. But if I think we marked these as lower priority, they can help. Certainly, if you feel like you have difficulty in uh, those topics and understanding systems, but we would definitely have you focus on some of those early references first uh, to get the gist of things. And um, uh, just a few other notes here. and. We, we note here, don't bother buying the manual for the CSI uh, specifications. Uh, I actually have that noted here. And that's this is all you need to know for that. Uh, it's, it's really about the wealth of the divisions that the master spec format has. And primarily from an architectural perspective, you're going to be looking at 0 through 14. Um, that being said, you're definitely going to need to understand what 21 to probably 32 33 yeah. um 32. yeah yeah and so what this is when you're writing specifications and everything every product or material that goes into the building uh, essentially gets split into one of these divisions and whether it's a concrete foundation wall oops sorry let me go back <laughs> Sorry, whether it's a concrete foundation wall would fall into division three or um, um, 
your doors and windows would fall under division eights for openings an elevator would fall under division 14 mm -hmm. and what's that yeah 14 yeah yeah mm -hmm. Yep. And, and these divisions can certainly have extremely uh, lengthy subdivisions, and there's a you can look up the master format table of contents uh, that I have noted here, and that it will basically list every single product that you can think of from dozens of different roof membranes, and each have their own subcategory in that division. From the perspective of the Aries, you, the all you really need to know is this high level understanding of the division sections um, and, and then understand where products might fall into those divisions. Uh, when we get into the case studies, um, it's important to understand how these are structured. If you look back at the first video that we did, we went into depth explaining the structure of case studies and how to approach those from the testing software perspective. Um, but always allow some extended time with your case studies uh, before answering questions. And there's a wealth of resources that are usually provided with these case studies. Uh, in particular, PDD uh, expects to have ADA experts, excerpts, some drawings from architectural drawings and consultant drawings, code excerpts, and specification excerpts. And all of these will not be, they're not going to, be, going to give you the entire code book. They're going to pull out a chapter or a section uh, that may be helpful, but sometimes they might give you more information than you need. There's different tools to be able to search through and bookmark tabs and to make that process a little bit more efficient. And again, we, we cover that in our first kind of intro video. Um, another quick note on just using that exam software that we cover in a little bit more detail, but uh, when, sometimes there's a word bank of objects, an object bank, I guess, <laughs> on the side of a question. And you have to pick up those objects, drag and drop them into the answer location for the question. Those objects are going to be presented in an orthogonal manner, mm -hmm. but in some cases, you're required to actually rotate those. And it's not a very clear operation, but you actually have to select them, right-click on it, and there's a rotate command that you can utilize from there and actually enter in the degrees that you'll, you want the object to rotate. And if this is ever required for a question, there will almost always be a reference in the question in some way to talk about what that angle wants yeah. to be. Whether that's something you need to figure out or uh, very small in this view right now, but there's just a little line showing a, a 10 degree angle here on the on the edge of this uh, site diagram. And uh, little things like that are, are all you need to kind of understand what the angle might need to be. Um, so this is our notes about time uh, that well, I'll just skim over really quick. So from the perspective of PDD, we have 100 questions and four hours and five minutes, it's 245 minutes. and if you set aside an hour to focus on those case studies, because you really do need time to sort of review those resources that they give you, um, then we'll have 82 normal questions is what we're calling after you get through the average number of case study questions. And ultimately you come out to about two and a quarter minutes per question. And that being said, you don't need to take all that time on a question, if, if you don't feel like you need it, say definitely bank up that time if you can be a little faster on some of the simpler questions. Uh, but so what we suggest is sort of setting benchmarks for yourself. If you, if you start that exam at eight in the morning and you wanna expect yourself to be at question 21 by 8.45 or 42 by 9.30, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you wanna be starting those case studies at 11 a.m to give yourself that full amount of time for those case studies. Yeah, so that's just an example. Uh, definitely take you know, the practice exams that NCARB offers to, they, are time, they can be timed exams, and so they give you an idea of that time pressure and how to manage that. And there's certainly other resources as well for um, practice tests that can simulate that. So you can get an idea of how you work. Uh, 
can certainly be different for other people. I know some people prefer to actually start the case studies first. Uh, so they can start that with a fresh, unfatigued mind and tackle that stuff immediately. One note with that that we like to mention with the sort of new organization of these exams and the breaks that you're allowed to take. Once you see a question, uh, doesn't matter if you even read it, if you had opened up on your screen for a second, then you have seen the question. If you take a break after that point, that question is no longer accessible. And so what that means is that with the case studies that have the, a wealth of resources, uh, say there's a multiple choice question on question 20 that asks about chapter 10 of the code for uh, means of egress. It might not give you a resource though to reference. Yeah, it's just one of those things that you're expected to know as a rule of thumb. Maybe it's slope of a ramp is 11, one to 12. Um, as you get to that, if you have an issue understanding that and know that there might be a resource available for you, flag that question. And when you get to a case study, you can see if that case study actually has that resource for you. And you can use that as a resource for a previous question. Uh, and one thing to be careful though, is if you look at all of the case study questions and then take a break, you won't have access to that. So depending on your confidence of the current case study that you're working on and what resources are available, sometimes we might say, leave one of those case study questions for last. Because even if it's just one question last left, you can go back to that after a break and have that full uh, resource availability still for that whole bank of case studies. So that's just a, a, a strategy thought process for managing the issue with breaks now. But um, again, take the practice exams and understand how time works for you. Uh, getting into the first section of the exam, the integration of buildings and systems. Uh... So these sections are also split up into varying objectives. And you, you'll see here that they also call, while this one I think was 32 to 38% of the exam, they'll also have each of these ex objectives split into for example here, five to nine percent of that section or of the exam. Uh, so what we're going to look at here is, you know, you're analyzing and, inter and the integration of systems and technologies to meet the project goals. Uh, you might need to resolve uh, roof details, curtain wall, cladding, window, et cetera, et cetera, d system details throughout the building. And uh, those are largely presented as section details, uh, as uh, construction details. Um, you might need be asked to determine the size of mechanical MEP systems and components to meet project goals. Uh, and you certainly don't need to be a mechanical engineer for this. Uh, they're, they're asking for a high level understanding of how a system might work, whether it be the select the benefits of VAV versus VRF uh, as a mechanical system and rooftop units versus DOAS and um, things like that. And often they'll have some sort of resource um, that you can reference that might be able to give you a hint to some of these things. Um, to determine the size of structural systems to meet project goals. There will be math on this exam. <laughs> And uh, a lot of it is usually tied to the structural systems. And usually it's going to be simple loading diagrams uh, to, or maybe a, a moment condition, a wind load, snow condition. Um, and there are typically structural equations that are provided uh, with the exam software that you can reference at any time that can give pretty basic layouts and. Um, even I think simple beam diagrams um, that are always available to reference if you if you feel like you need help with that. Um, there is also integrating specialty systems like acoustics, lighting, fire suppression uh, with 
elevators, access controls, and understanding those systems as well and how they tie into the architectural environment. Um, it's determining how to detail the integration of multiple building systems and technologies. Uh, again, it's basically every objective that we talked about so far, how do they all work together? Uh, and then coordinating everything, coordinating MEP, structural, specialty systems and technologies, uh, making those all work together effectively and without issue. So, like I said, there's going to be some math. Uh, so we can get right into some of these sample questions, kind of thinking about um, these sections. So this in particular is a structural consideration. Um, the question is, an architect is sizing a glue laminated ridge beam for a wood framed residential project. The design snow load is 60 PSF. What is the total snow load for linear foot on the ridge beam? And so one thing to pull out first from these is, you know, find, the, find those significant details uh, about the question. So we've got that what, what we're trying to determine is what does this ridge beam need to take? Um, these, these edges are important, but the question's really about these ridge, this ridge beam here. Uh, while it is a wood framed project, we're really looking at uh, a simple diagram here. And it, whether it was wood, steel, concrete, the question would be the same. Um, and a, an important note with snow load is that that is a vertical acting load. You don't need to take the slope of the roof into consideration when it comes to snow load. And so we're looking at 60 PSF across this. And since these walls are taking some of that load, you'll need to split this up to see what is focused on the ridge beam. And so we'll, we'll go th through that a little bit. The answer is 600 pounds per foot. And essentially you're doing the tributary width of that ridge beam is taking, you know, half of each of those roofs on either side of it of 10 feet total, 10 times 60 gets you to 600. And they, they have a reference here to the IBC discussing how snow loads are assumed to act vertically on that horizontal projection. And so all of these questions that we'll go over today will have a rationale and they typically have a reference on what you might be able to refer to if you have an issue understanding uh, a particular question or concept. It'll have a target to, for you to point to if, uh, if you want to look into it a little bit further. Uh, and, and another important note for this is the units are provided with the question. Um, and so that that gives you a hint for the answer that they're looking for to the degree. So we we're looking for pounds per foot here and they gave us uh, pounds per square foot. And so you're, you're really looking to just reduce that by one figure down to a pound per foot. Mm -hmm. And so you know that the, the unit that you had to multiply was a factor of length. So going on to a second question in this area, we've got a hold hydraulic elevator has been selected for a new low rise development. During the project documentation, which of the following should the architect consider? Consider the three that apply. So some important things to note about this question is we've got a hold hydraulic elevator. Um, the two major types of elevators that they're gonna expect you to know are the hydraulic elevator and the traction elevator and basic concepts of those two. And we're looking at a low rise development, so it doesn't need to be an incredibly tall elevator. Uh, and so you have some flexibility between those types, but they've specifically chosen the hydraulic. Um, and we've got six items here. And an important note is that they tell you specifically that there are three that you need to select. So, um, Sometimes it helps to eliminate some of these items. Uh, you'll have options in the test software to highlight or strike through uh, different items in the in the question if, in case that helps you organize your thoughts a bit. Uh, so some thoughts with a low rise hydraulic elevator. We can go through some of these things really quick. You're always gonna need support rails. 
because that's what guides the car, whether how as it goes up and down. Counterweights are typically a result of a traction elevator. That's how it manages the weight of the car, drops the counterweight to pull the car up on the, the traction belts. Um, a pit is going to be relevant in both types. So again, that's something that we're likely going to need. Um, hoisting cables, again, is part of that counterweight and traction assembly on a traction elevator. And a penthouse machine room, there's modern elevators have lots of options for machine rooms. Some of them are um, built into the shaft. Some of them can be basement. Some of them can be penthouse. I think that one's maybe a gray area. Uh, and then the piston and underground cil cylinder, that is the essential concept of the hydraulic elevator, is that it's essentially a stacking piston that underground that is pushing that elevator up as it telescopes out. And so I'd say the, the answers are your, your car support rails, the elevator pit, and then the piston and cylinder. And so th this is pretty typical of what you'd see for these uh, select all that apply kind of questions um, where you're, you're going to have some very clear answers. You're going to have some very clear wrong answers, and you're going to have some gray areas. Um, so what they talk about here, this is can be clarified from that mechanical and electrical equipment um, standards. And they, it's discussing the critical components of a primary elevator system. And again, as they talk about, they go into each of these sections that are kind of detailed here as well. And talking about the hoisting cables and counterweights. And they state a penthouse machine room are typically components of a traction elevator. Uh, but again, I, I think that can be a little flexible depending on the manufacturer. They, they change that stuff a lot. Um, all right. We'll have a third question in this section. And this is one of those details that architectural graphic standards would be, uh, and Building Construction Illustrated would be a huge help on. Uh, it's basically a wealth of these kind of details that explain how the system is assembled and uh, give graphic representation to explain that. So in this brick cavity wall section below, drag the material labels from the left into the boxes on the wall section detail. Not all labels will be used. So we've got a word bank on our left, we've got the detail on the right with uh, specific things called out. And so we're, you're just dragging and dropping those items into the specific boxes. So if we take it from the top down, we've got this one looks to be pointing at uh, an aluminum curtain wall system with glazing. And one thing to note is that it looks like it's a double pane system on an exterior wall. That's going to be your insulated glazing unit. And so that one's going to go here. And then oh, I, call, I call this curtain wall, but uh, for the arrow specifically that's pointing to the framing, that's going to be your aluminum storefront. And then as we're getting down here, sometimes some of these details are pretty small, but you need to understand how the system's built to understand what they may be looking at here. Um, so right here, we've got something going between the brick all the way back to a concrete masonry unit here. That's going to be your masonry tie. So that's that's how that brick is tied back to that, that structural wall. Um, and then we've got next one down. We see this is just a 45 degree line. It doesn't really give you a ton of information, but it's it's all about the context of the drawing. So you see this line going from the face of the brick in, over, and up the wall. That is going to be your uh, through wall flashing. So again, it goes through that brick to the back wall, and it flashes back the system. Um, and then the last thing we have here, it looks like it's just a brick, but it has an X through it. A couple context notes here. Um, that is just above that flashing. So that's where the water in the in that cavity of the system is gonna come down at that flashing, go under the brick. It needs a little help to get through that wall. That is a weep vent. And I've certainly seen these presented in different graphical ways on occasion. This isn't how I would typically draw a weep vent in some of our standard details, but 
uh, it is a typically accepted detail. Uh, so that those are kind of the details that we work through there. And some of the rationale on that is, you know, the, the wall section detail provided with this system is again, illustrated in graphic standards. Masonry tires are, ties are required to anchor the brick veneer back to the wall backup. Through wall flashing is required to divert the moisture as we explained and has entered or and exits the wall through the weep fence or holes. Um, and then we've got the storefront system with the IGUs. So I did note that there, while some of the options we had over here were irrelevant to this drawing, uh, there is one more item that's shown in this drawing that wasn't necessarily part of the question. Um, and if you're looking at it, it's gonna be that cavity drainage material. So there's metal copings usually gonna be on a roof edge sort of condition where we're down at the foundation. Plate anchor, that's a, a structural detail usually carrying a brick lintel kind of condition. So again, that's gonna be the head of the storefront. Uh, and a Z furring channel, that would go with a completely different exterior facade system, say a metal panel kind of thing. Um, so, but what we have here is this is a cavity wall and you need that cavity drainage material, uh, essentially helps catch mortar droppings and other debris that might be in that wall. And rather than having that all gather at the bottom where that flashing is and clogging the system, that cavity drainage material is a very porous netting that, but is able to capture those droppings and not clog up the system. So it protects that cavity wall system from, so it's able to still drain. All right, John, you wanna take construction documentation? You're still muted, bud. All right, yeah, construction yeah, documentation is the next section. It's another pretty large section of this exam. So like 30 to 40% and get into it, some of the objectives. So it is about kind of putting together a complete construction document set in that all of them work together, like all the drawings are all coordinated and it's clear and concise for the contractor to understand. And it's also about coordinating some of these drawings with other consultants, like civil engineers, landscape architects, structural engineers. And that's all to maybe make some ad drawings that aren't necessarily, that need some help with from beyond the architect's approach. Um, and then appropriate documentation, that's about, yeah, resolving all those architectural systems with the consultants again. You know, windows, doors, stairs, other systems like that. Okay. And then again, assembling construction document set and also meeting the standard of care, which we kind of briefly talked about in the practice management division, which is, you know, that the architect would perform its services consistent with other architects in the area practicing other under similar circumstances and also incorporating value engineering into the document set if that's requested by the client and then also thinking about which project delivery method may be best based on the client's needs and their schedule Before we keep moving, uh, I wanted to say welcome to Justin. Uh, we, we've we gotten through the first section so far, but there's still plenty of content to cover. Uh, we'll, we'll end up posting this on YouTube uh, in the near future, and you're welcome to look back at things then uh, if you like. Would you be able to give us a quick intro to yourself and just uh, understand where you're at in the ARE process? Sure, sure. Uh, sorry for being late. I'm just on vacation at the moment and totally 
lost track uh, of time. Absolutely. But, all right. Um, yeah, I, I basically just have two more um, exams to go, and it's the PPD and the PDD. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just been kind of cruising along there, about to be taking the PPD at the end of July. So, all right, fantastic. Uh, the content in this one will definitely still be relevant for that exam as well. So they're, they're both right, very right. very similar. So, all right, well, we'll keep moving, and let us know if you have any questions or thoughts. Will do. Thank you. We'll get into yeah, one of the sample questions. So glass is being used for the exterior storefront system of a clothing store located in a cold climate. A client has requested that the glass be neutral in color and as transparent as possible to allow maximum visibility into the store. So what type of glass should the architect specify for the storefront system? Can go through these options. So I think a good thing to note in the question is that it's a located in a cold climate. So we might want to consider what requirements are needed for glazing systems in that type of climate. And then also that they want it to be as clear as possible, transparent as possible. So single pane gray glass with low E coating, that would not be the best option because single pane is not very insulating. And while the low E coating is something that we would want to help with that insulation, the U value, um, it's just not going to be right with a single pane. And then double pane insulating light glass unit with clear glass and ceramic frit pattern. That would be a good option, except the ceramic frit pattern isn't a transparent surface. Double pane insulating glass unit with clear glass. That seems like it would be a good answer, but we'll go to the next option, double pane insulating glass unit with low iron clear glass and a low E coating. That's probably going to be the best option in this case because with the low iron glass, it's that green tint won't be visible there. So sorry, I was going to say that's exactly what they note on the rationale of that, that iron content. Yeah. So yeah, just keeping in mind, like, it's good to read the question and Sorry. take into account all the requirements for your answer. And it's good to read all the answers, you know, because, I mean, the third one was a pretty good answer, but, you know, clear as possible. So, yeah, low iron. Okay, so... Next question is during the review of the 95%. So we're pretty far along construction documents cost estimate for a hospital project. Construction costs are estimated to exceed the funds available for construction by 12%. So prior to the bidding phase, what should the architect recommend to the owner? Um, incorporate design alternates into the documents. That seems like pretty good answer since we're so far along and we could incorporate some alternative like materials or systems into the drawings that could save some costs um eliminate project contingency budget budget that's pretty risky because i mean we're not quite aware of what's you know going to be on the project, don't know what we're gonna find during construction. So we wanna leave a little room for contingencies for unforeseen circumstances. Um, assume construction bids will be under budget. That's also pretty risky because I mean, what if they're not? And uh, so like looking back, we're trying to decrease costs. So that's not good to rely on something like that. And then reduce the scope of the project. 
that would help save some costs, but we're so far along, like 95%, that it's probably not the best option because it would be a lot of work just to, you know, redo like a pretty ma good majority of the drawings. So option one would be the best option in this case. Yeah, and I, I always tell people if you, uh, if you eliminate your project contingency, it's a great way to find a building underground on your site as soon as you start digging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely, definitely the riskiest thing you could do. And then also, yeah, with um, that fourth option, which is not best, it would also delay, yeah, the project, which we would not want either. Mm -hmm. By doing the design alternates, you can keep it moving forward. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think the, the other phrase I often hear is, you know, mm -hmm. like hoping for bid day savings. That's not a reality anymore. Uh, <laughs> you, you used to be able to say that sometimes, but it's, it's not. And it's, it's a high hope at best. But, all right. Yeah. You have project manual and specifications. Yeah. So the next question uh, section is about the, all the documents needed specs and like how to identify these documents from the drawings themselves. So assembling them, I like to think of like the project manual is like all the documents that would fit in a binder. So it wouldn't include the like, um, large drawings. Um, so yeah, it's coordinating the project manual, the, the contracts, the general conditions, the bidding documents, and then project requirements, all the other ones with the contractor. And then objective 3.2, identify and prioritize components required to write, maintain, and refine project specs. So that's determining like which items from the master format you would need for those like project specific requirements and then also knowing different like testing procedures and standards of materials and methods and then coordinating specs with construction docs so that's yeah really about making sure they all work in together there So we can go to a sample item here. Uh, architect is detailing a two hour rated wall assembly between a lecture hall and a lobby corridor for a new business school. Wall thickness needs to be minimized and acoustical separation between the spaces needs to be maximized. So which interior wall assembly is appropriate for this location? So a few things to keep in mind for this question is that it's two hour rated wall. So like what types of wall assembly is gonna get us that rating? And then also we need to think about possible ways to minimize the thickness of it, but maximize, yeah, the STC rating. So sound transmission class, um, in this case, the option A, so two layers of 5 eighths type X gypsum board on one side and then only one layer on the other side. That actually would not quite get us two hours. Um, and then the next option, so two layers gypsum board and then the fiber insulation, that would get us, yeah, two hours. So keep that option in mind. And then one layer of one inch type X gypsum board on one side, and then two layers, five eighths inch on the other side, four inch metal CH stud. Um, probably would not be the 
best option. And then one layer of a quarter inch gypsum bore each side with an additional layer of five eighths each side. And then only two and a half inch metal stud. And then the insulation isn't the full cavity. So yeah, option C would be the best choice in this case. And it has a full bed of insulation in that cavity wall as well. So yeah, and their rationale they go into, you know, some of these things are mentioned in arch architectural graphic standards as typical assemblies and such, yeah. and they give STC ratings. It's it's a little difficult to look at these and understand what the STC rating is going to be. Uh, but as far as the fire rating, some of the things that uh, you can think about is typically two layers of that type X chip is equivalent to one hour fire rating. Uh, so say if, if you, you know, this one, sure, this would be one hour rated, but I wouldn't take it much past there. Having the quarter inch chip is kind of weird uh, in general. This one would get you close to like 90 minutes, but I don't think this would even get past an hour yeah. system technically as far as like a UL system. But since you've got the two layers on both sides, you essentially get one hour here, one hour here. That's a two hour system. This is technically a two hour system too, but one thing to note with that is that that's a shaft wall condition. And with the CH stud, you've essentially got your your channel on the inside and then you've got this h shape that kind of reaches out and grabs the tail end of that that's essentially so in conditions where you know a, a shaft wall condition where you can really only construct from this side and so you're able to kind of take that shaft wall place it into those uh little legs and then assemble from this side typically on other walls you'd be able to assemble from both sides not an issue this is not going the shaft, the shaft liner side is not going to be a finished condition. And so I think that was that was one of the notes from the question of, um, you know, it's, it's in a lobby corridor in a new business school and a, and a lecture hall. Like, you need both sides of that wall to be finished conditions. Uh, I don't doubt that this would meet the performance requirements that were laid out. It's just not the right condition for that kind of a wall. Yeah. Any other notes? all I had on this one. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions about that particular question? Nope. Okay. So yeah, next question. A client rep for a publicly funded project has requested the specs be written in a way to promote competition and maximize client value. Uh, which methods of specifying should the architect consider? So we have descriptive, master spec, performance, proprietary, reference, and restrictive. Um, so it's important to note here that it's a publicly funded project and they want to promote competition. So in that case, like some items that we could eliminate would be proprietary because it wouldn't allow any like, you know, alternates. It, it's only like for one specific product or it has to meet specific requirement there. So it wouldn't allow any competition. And then descriptive, that would be a good option. Um, performance as well, as well as reference. Um, restrictive, that, I don't, that's not even a type of spec, I believe, so. And then master spec isn't a type of spec per se, it's, it's referring to, like, the specifications, all the divisions. So. And then, yeah, Architect's Handbook Professional Practice goes through, like, all the descriptions of that in a greater detail. So that's another good resource for this exam, is that book, again. It's really a good resource for just about every exam. So. 
And I think that one's pretty available. I think most firms would have that on a on a shelf somewhere. Yeah. And I think we have. Uh, I think a, the, even like the Cincinnati Library has a copy. Mm -hmm. And I think they said um, in the rationale. I I'd agree with you. I did not recognize restrictive at first, but I think they say that it is technically uh, a, a type of specification, but it, it falls right next to proprietary in terms of its intent. But. All right. Okay, this is um, one of these questions where it's like a hot spot where you would click on the drawing. Um, so architect is completing a coordination review of the exterior materials with the specs received from the consultant spec writer. Click on the element in the elevation below that is missing from the specifications. So I think we can go through some of these and go through like these labels on this drawing here, annotations, and see if they can, if they're included in this table of contents. So sheet metal coping, that would be in division seven, thermal and moisture protection. Um, metal composite wall panel that would also fall under that same division since it's like an exterior cladding material. Um, aluminum curtain wall, yes, that would be under division eight openings. Aluminum windows also fall under division eight. Metal wall louvers. Yes, um, that would be again under, I believe that'd be under Division 7 again. And then cast stone coping, that's uh, type of masonry, Division 4. Um, metal railings, that would be a type of metal fabrication that's in Division 5. And yeah, I'm not seeing that on the table of contents. So that's likely the right answer. We can go ahead and go through these other options as well. Yeah, sorry. that's the right answer. Yeah, okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think with, included, so. yeah, I think with this question, like uh, it, it might it might be helpful first to kind of skim through that table of contents to see, yeah. you can very quickly see, you know, number five, zero and one aren't gonna relate to projects or products that's gonna be like, uh, product project setup and everything general things and then uh it looks like division five and division 14 are missing from a architectural standpoint mm -hmm. uh and i don't see an elevator for division 14 so um it, another good approach yeah but yeah I, again you can approach it from a couple different ways and justin i noted this earlier uh we looked at the mass respect table of contents um and you could look back at that and you know just quickly familiarize yourself with what those divisions are and not necessarily you don't have to get into the details of it just understanding which division each of these items would fall into exactly how john walked through it sounds good thank you yeah there's um, just a quick diagram that kind of goes through oh, yeah. like what's included in all of these, you know, like project manual, contract documents, and bidding documents. So this kind of shows kind of what we had talked about earlier is in the project manual includes like all the contracts, the agreements, conditions, the contract, and then the specs that you could put in the binder and then contract documents include the drawings as well, but not the bidding requirements. But if we look here, it also would include any addenda to contract documents or modifications to the contract. And then the bidding documents, they would include all but any modifications to the contract. So like the construction contract. Yeah, cool. I don't think I've ever seen that diagram before. That's yeah. 
That's helpful. All right, so getting into some of the codes and regulations. Again, this was a, I think this was one of the smaller uh, divisions of this exam. Everything was kind of pretty heavy on those first two sections, but uh, this one's, it's gonna be useful to understand being able to, it's really not memorizing the building code, it's understanding where to find something in the building code, uh, if that helps make sense. Uh, it's really about a navigation skill of understanding where to look for something. And, and then there are some general sort of rules of thumb, um, things that they, NCARB will expect you to know by memory uh, as far as code is concerned. So uh, we're gonna look at determined adherence to building regulatory requirements at a detail level. So understanding what the code's gonna require in the details that we're looking at, and then determined adherence with specialty regulatory regulatory requirements. Uh, and so that's probably gonna be for different, as it notes here, energy, um, historic preservation, environmental regulations, and other things along those lines. Uh, so getting straight into a question. So this one's gonna be from chapter 10 about means of egress. Uh, so we're looking at the occupancy of the top floor of a museum project has increased from 800 to 1200 occupants. The building contains an automatic fire sprinkler system, emergency communication system, and four stairwells to provide equally distributed egress from all floors. Drag the dimensions from the left into the three boxes on the enlarged stair plan to identify the minimum dimensions required for egress. Not all dimensions will be used. So we've got, this is where we're trying to place our answer. So we've got uh, essentially a word bank here with different sizes of dimensions and it looks like we have three boxes to answer in for uh, width of stair and width of this door and what they've done here is they've actually given us an excerpt of the code as a reference straight in the question and I've, I've blown this up a little bit to kind of pull out some important language here uh, so from the question some of the important notes were that we're, we're looking to manage 1200 occupants there's an automatic sprinkler system in the building. There's an um, emergency voice alarm communication system. And there's four stairwells that are calling for equal distribution throughout the building. And so as we're looking at specifically section 1005 that they gave us for means of egress sizing, that's gonna give us all the information that we need here. Uh, and so looking at uh, capacity based on occupant load, uh, looking at stairways specifically, uh, typically the capacity of a stairway would be measured as a fa capacity factor of 0.3 inches per occupant. But it's worth reading into the exception here because that can be reduced to 0.2 inches per occupant in buildings equipped throughout with an automatic sprinkler system and a emer uh, compliant emergency voice alarm communication system, which we have both of. So now your, your stair width can be reduced to only 0.2 per occupant rather than the 0.3. Keep reading into other egress components. This is gonna cover your doors and it's a similar condition. So your typical would call for 0.2 inches per occupant but since we have the sprinkler system and the voice alarm communication system, that's gonna reduce us to 0.15. So this is a pretty typical condition that you're, you're gonna tackle this question at the beginning of every project you'd start. Is, you know, is your factor gonna be 0.3 or 0.2? Because you're gonna know, are you gonna sprinkler this building or are you not? And that's gonna be like the big driver of that factor as you're going into it. So. We've got 1,200 occupants, and from the stair perspective, we'll divide that by 0.2, and that's gonna give it, oh, I'm sorry, multiply by the 0.2. And that's gonna give us 240 um, inches for the capacity of that stair, and divide that by 12, no, I did something wrong, shit. I'm sorry, we'll just go to this next one. Uh, tw oh, sorry, that's that's what I did wrong. 1,200 divided by four. I missed that first part of the question that talks about equally distributing things. And then I'm gonna multiply that 
300 times the 0.2, and that gives me 60 inches for the stair. And then from the door perspective, uh, you're going to multiply that by 0.15, that's going to give you 45 inches for the door. And so translate that to the actual answers that they've given you. That's three foot nine inches for the door and five foot zero inches for the stairs. And an important note here is that the stair was, they gave you two answer boxes here, but it's the same answer for both. And they actually give you multiples of some of these things as you drag them out. And, and so you can answer the same thing twice uh, for a lot of conditions. So. Sorry, I got I tripped on myself there because again I forgot that first step of the calculation, and so it's definitely important to understand that situation. Even if they're not giving you the full picture in this diagram, uh, it's it's worth noting those important details. All right, so on to the next question. We've got a looks like a building section here. The architect is designing an addition to an existing medical research building. An accessible route between the buildings is required on all floors. What is the minimum length of an unobstructed straight ramp system required to create an accessible route between the existing and new buildings on floor six, including top and bottom landings? So it looks like we've got a difference between the height of floor six on the new building side versus the existing building side. And they're asking for an accessible route between the buildings. And, you know, that, that accessible route can have some flexibility, but typically you're gonna be putting in a ramp. And so that's what they're asking for here. And you're gonna to wanna to understand how much length you actually need to manage that ramp. This is one of those things that NCARB is gonna expect you to know some of the details of what makes an accessible ramp uh, by memory and not you're not going to have a reference for this one so some important notes here is that a an accessible ramp is a maximum slope of 1 to 12 uh, meaning if, if you're traveling 12 feet your maximum rise is one foot and for every 30 inches of rise in that ramp two and a half feet you need a split in that ramp with a landing a horizontal landing that is at least five feet in length. And then in addition to that, at the starting point and the end point of your ramp, you need an additional landing that is a minimum of five feet as well. So to tackle this problem, first we're gonna to need to figure out how much height do we actually need to manage through this. And since there's different floor to floor heights, it gets a little weird, but it looks like once you add it all up, there's a three foot difference between the floors or 36 inches. And so you you need to vertically travel 36 inches with a ramp. And I've got a diagram that's gonna kind of help with this as we explain it, even though I'm giving the answer away. But <laughs> essentially you've got each of these, you've got more than 36 inches of travel. So you need to split this ramp into two sections at least. And so you need a five foot landing to start, a one stretch of ramp that is going to be 30 feet or less, a landing in the middle, another stretch of ramp that is 30 feet or less, and then your ending landing. The way that they worked through this problem is that they had a section of ramp that is 30 feet long, and then a landing, and then a section of ramp that is six feet long. You could do that as um, 18 feet split evenly across both sections. That doesn't really matter how you manage that. But as far as the math's concerned, you get to the same spot of having essentially 36 feet of sloping ramp and three five foot landings gets you to 51 feet. All right. Any questions before we move on to cost estimates? All right, I think this one's yours, John. Yeah. yeah, so last section of this division, yeah, construction cost estimates, it's the lowest like percentage of questions, but still good, important to know like how to like 
value engineer or reduce costs if that's required, like from a client standpoint, or maybe thinking about like materials that you could substitute that would give similar like appearance, but also don't cost as much. So yeah, we'll get into some questions here. So this one is referred to the exhibit. So an architect has received construction cost estimate for an 85,000 gross square feet elementary school that is $420,000 over the construction budget. The owner requests that the current brick veneer cavity wall system with a metal stud backup be replaced with a more effective system while maintaining a similar exterior aesthetic. The contractor has provided pricing for alternative exterior systems. So based on this pricing information, which system should the architect recommend to the client? So I think before we even get into like calculations for this, we could think of which of these systems would even give a similar like aesthetic as the brick veneer. So first option, EIFS, metal stud backup, it's probably not the best option since that's more of like a stucco type of system from an exterior finish point of view. Um, precast concrete, insulated panels, form liner, exterior finish. That one would not give a, the same exterior finish appearance. Um, precast concrete insulated panels with thin brick exterior finish. That's a possible option since it's also a brick veneer. And then thin brick on thin set mortar with metal stud backup. So it's, I would narrow it down like first to these last two options here. And then we would get into some calculations. So trying to reduce it by 420,000. I think we do calculation on the thin brick on thin set mortar. Metal stud backup. Uh, that's yeah, forty nine. Uh, I think that ends up being a little too much still. Say we do 30,000 square feet again, times 49, six, 12. Yeah, it's yeah, that's the right answer is the precast concrete insulated panels. Yeah, and I think uh an important note here is you know they kind of try to throw you off by giving you the square footage of the entire elementary school. Mm -hmm. That's not really the important number when you're talking about the the veneer system. Uh, it's that, but that 30,000 square foot quantity is that, that face area of that system that it was important to go off of. And I think, uh, yeah, using their math, they were, they, they did it from the perspective of the, of I'll just cal calculating like savings yeah. per square foot, but yeah, you can approach that math in a couple different ways. And yeah, I think uh, 
Yeah, I think you're right. The the fin thin brick on the thin set mortar was slightly a little bit it didn't under. didn't quite get you to that savings that they needed. And yeah. All right. Okay, so architect. So this one is a yeah check three that apply. An architect reviews the construction cost estimate for a financial institution located in a cold climate. The contractor needs to reduce the cost of the project by at least $26,000 and has included options that were presented by the curtain wall supplier. The building's energy performance is a top priority of the client. So which cost savings option should the architect consider? And then check the three that apply. So I think since the question gives that, you know, performance and energy savings is top priority and also that it's in a cold climate. There's some key notes about this question to take out. So which cost savings option? So changing the tint of the windows from brown to gray, that would probably be a good option since it, it's really just affecting the aesthetic appearance of it and that's not really a priority in this case. It may be in some other ones, but not this one. Um, reduce the airspace from three quarters inch to one quarter inch on all insulated glazing units. Um, even though that's gonna save quite a bit there, um, reducing that airspace is gonna also reduce the amount of insulation. So the it's gonna, increase the U value so it wouldn't be as insulated as the three quarter inch one. So that's probably not a good option. Um, removing the interior entry vestibule, that would not be a good option either since that would allow air infiltration into the building and then it would likely crank up the heating needed to replace all that lost heat every time that entry is opened up. Um, remove the low E coating from the window glazing. Uh, again, even though that saves quite a bit, that's gonna reduce the performance without that coating on there. Um, revise custom hardware to the manufacturer's standard hardware. So instead of using a custom hardware, using a standard, that would be a good option since it's not, doesn't have any effect on the performance. Um, and then revise the finish of these windows from the frames from fluoropolymer coating to anodized aluminum finish. That would be a good option as well since it's only affecting the aesthetic appearance of the frames. So in this case, the option, the first option, and then the fourth and fifth option, fifth and sixth. Yeah, fifth and sixth, I meant. Yeah, and I think this one was, it's structured a little odd. I don't know if this would survive yeah. in the test and might get reworded, but they kind of give it away. Uh, with saying that you need three to kind of build to this number. When like, if you just did options two and three, that would get you to 26,000 with only two. So they gave that away a little bit, but uh, it's the, the concept of the question still applies, certainly. And I, I think, uh, yeah, every everything you said was relevant. Every other option on there was, uh, you know, sacrificing that energy performance. Uh, All right, so that's all we've got for the specifics of that exam. Um, but before we wrap things up, we wanted to talk a little bit about the resources that we offer as AIA Cincinnati. Uh, so at this link here, and this is there's a link to this also available at uh, AIA Cincinnati's website. So we've got a Google spreadsheet that actually I should just pull this up. Um, 
we've basically taken that reference sheet from NCARB and gone through each resource that they suggest. And through a little bit of discussion internally, we've kind of prioritized a few things and defined which ones we think are the most important, most cost effective to study with. Um, and let's see, here we go. Can you see that or do I need to? Yeah, okay. Wasn't sure if it was specific to the slideshow. So this is that spreadsheet that we have. And you know, this will this will help out a lot if you're trying to figure out what material resources to kind of pick up to study with. And so we've got a study priority on the left here. And so that's gonna point you toward some of the higher end study guides or you know, some of the typical documents that the the test will reference, like the AIA documents, the handbook of professional practice. And in over here, we'll, we'll detail a description, the cost of that product, and you know, where you can find it. Uh, and hopefully you can find it in a free or uh, rentable condition kind of thing, or like through the library. Um, there's all sorts of different things on here that you can, you can get a lot of this for free or um, at least be able to reference it. And some specifically we looked at since city of cincinnati's public library for if they have even an older edition available but they're not always immediately available and you can check other libraries as well um and we we gave a short description of what our thoughts were and the takeaways for some of these products so like our textual graphic standards was a huge one that was referenced for this test we put that as a priority too, just because it's a little bit more focused on uh, a couple specific exams. It's not an overall reference for the entire uh, assembly, but absolutely helpful for this exam and we'll kind of detail which ones that hits on the most. And so you got all these through there uh, down to some that maybe we wouldn't necessarily recommend our your first set of books to pick up, uh, but they're certainly listed as uh, a viable reference uh, and then in this we also list a few third-party resources that are available that might not be directly through NCARB uh, or the AIA but they are certainly valuable resources and they work better for different people um, for instance designer hacks has uh, a ton of example questions and quizzes that you can run through from 10 to 15 questions, uh, quick quizzes to just kind of keep you in the mindset of the testing. Um, or there's full services like Black Spectacles that has everything from hours on hours of lectures and flashcards and practice exams that are probably the most similar to the actual exam that from anything that I've looked at. Um, but then you've got a, a number of other resources. Amber Books is a big one that my firm's working into right now, but it is pricey. Um, and there's a few other things on here as well. I know NCARB also has their own practice exam for each division as well. Uh, so worth looking into if you're looking for some extra resources to help you study uh, and a little bit of guidance there. We also have, so a number of those things we have in the AIA Cincinnati's possession. There's particularly the uh, PPI books. It's a big study guide. We have a physical copy of that. And you're welcome to check in with uh, Julie Carpenter. We'll be available to be able to check those out physically if you'd like to use those. And we're also working with AIA Ohio on having a digital library that you can check things out uh, much more freely as well. And we're, we're partnering with them so we can have one, a larger wealth of materials and two, it, it's just, uh, it's easier to communicate at the state level with everyone rather than each, each jurisdiction trying to uh, pick up their own study resources. So we're working through that. Uh, contact us if you need any help or any of those additional resources and trying to save a, a, a buck there if we've already got the resources it's, it's there for you we've got a few more study sessions to come a couple um reschedules and uh we typically do those at the last saturday of each month like this uh we've been sticking to 
10 a.m. Uh, is working pretty well for us on those days. And you're always welcome to just reach out to us at the early professional committees or other members of AI Cincinnati can uh, likely point you in the right direction. I know uh, Izid, uh, you said Darian's extremely helpful. She's she's our chair of the early professionals committee. She's extremely helpful and can absolutely point you in the right direction. Yes. And, yeah, and Justin, you can feel free to reach out to us or even Julie Carpenter uh, will point you to one of us as well. I, I know she's uh, she's got a, a hand in everything in AIA Cincinnati right now and she'll know exactly, if she doesn't have the answer for you, she'll know exactly who does. So on that note, I think that's all we've got for you today. And we actually got through things pretty quickly today. Uh, do you have any questions, comments, uh, or any specific topics you'd like to spend a little bit more time on, especially since we do have a little extra time today? We can dive a bit deeper into something else. So I have a question. Yeah. Yep. So basically on this topic of this, of the AOE is mainly we got a big chunk of calculations. So based on what you show us guys today on the exam, is it going to be much complicated or just going to be on the same level? So I think the, the calculations that we had today were, um, it's probably typical of what you'd see, but there will certainly be some more complex questions. Um, I know I've hit, I think one that tripped me up personally was like an overturning moment question, uh, which, you know, that was a structural concept that it never quite sat well with me uh, in my structures classes kind of thing. I was great with the simple beam diagrams, but that one in particular, like it threw me for a loop. Um, one thing I would recommend looking at, so you've got, you've got your study resources in the, this is the, I'm sorry, this is the a ARE guidelines that I just pulled up. So this is available on NCARB's website that you can look at. And when you get past the, the details of each exam, you can get into the study resources section. And this is where they have that full matrix that we looked at a little bit earlier. But as you get deeper into this, um, you can find you know, common abbreviations, common terms, but then we can also get into formulas that all of these are actually available on the in the test software. Uh, as a reference, they, I think there's a top bar that has like the calculator and then there's a bar for references and it'll have equations from acoustic equations, uh, general MEP concepts and uh, equations on those. And then there's actually quite an extensive set of resources for structural um, calculations. So I think this is absolutely worth reviewing to just familiarize yourself of what is a possible equation that you might have to understand and utilize. Um, and here, here's some electrical ones from like foot candles and um, plumbing pressure and there's acoustics. And, but again, I think there's definitely more detailed, I don't think this is exactly what's on the test, um, but these, these will be available on the, exam as well. So you got simple beam diagrams and formulas, uh, three pages of that. You've got uh, fixed beams and overhanging beams, and you've got general steel shapes. Uh, let's see, we've got structural nomenclature. So there's, there's a number of things that will be available to you on the test if you need that additional resource. But I would definitely suggest running through this and or even opening NCARB's demo exam and running through what they have available on the actual test. Let me open that up real quick. I'm going to flip. Oh no, we have a dead link. find it. Sorry, this one's taking me a minute. 
Does that does that start to answer your question, Yazid, as I'm, I'm trying to get into this? Yes, very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Here's the free demo example. So it seems what they actually had on that, the guidelines is saying exactly what they show in here. Yeah, so I'll just jump into a random question here. So again, this is available on NCARB's website. This looks exactly like one of the questions that we were looking at. Uh, they might have worded a little bit differently here, but so as you look at references, so you've got, you know, your acoustic, electrical. This is taking an interesting amount of time to load there. Um, so, you know, HVC, electrical, plumbing, is just like one sheet. But then you've got 39 sheets of structural. Uh, so they've got a ton of information for you here. And a lot of this, you know, you can organize by the, the sidebar to help navigate or do a search if you need something or you know jump through this and so there's some simple beam diagrams for you and the you know associated formulas to work through that um trying to see what other content they have so yeah it's, it's mostly these diagrams of different loading conditions you've got these standard steel shapes and the dimensions for those it's several several sheets of that these are basically straight out of you know the structural design book and rounds tubes yeah so that should get you ba basically any structural question that you have on the exam while it's not going to tell you how to do it in here you'll have a basis of that loading diagram and formulas that you can use to help with that. If it's not, if it's not in here, it will be every resource that you have will be given to you in the question itself. Uh, and so if you if you go back to our, uh, oh come on, oh here we go. If you go back to our the first question that we did. You know, every resource you need is actually. It's understanding the concept, and then every resource you need is in this question itself. Um, but in other cases, you'll otherwise have the reference that you need there. That's great. Yeah. Uh, can you get back actually to the exam demo? I have yeah. a question. Is it going to be the same uh, interface as in the pre exam? Yes, this, this is the exact software that they use for the actual okay. exam. That's good. It, it can be a little clunky. <laughs> it doesn't always work how you want it to. And, you know, their, their whiteboard program, this is, they, they don't give you uh, scratch paper and a pencil mm -hmm. anymore. This is, this is what you get for that. And so this is basically, you know, Microsoft Paint. You can do a couple functionalities there. You can add pages. Um, okay. And we, we go into pretty in-depth detail of, working with this interface and the resources that they give you in the testing software in that introduction video that we have that should be available uh, on AIA, AIA Cincinnati's YouTube okay. page. That's good, thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? All right, I think we can wrap this up today, uh, give you a little bit of time on your Saturday back and Justin, thanks for giving us some of your vacation time. <laughs> uh, I hope you have a good time wherever you're at and you all have yeah, a good no weekend. Problem, Rod. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, John. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. And again, if you have any questions either in the next hour or two weeks from now, before, right before you take an exam, feel free to reach out to us. We're, we're here to help. Thanks. You all have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. It's...